All right, Steeler fans, it is Monday. It's time for the Monday Morning Conversation. Really excited to have this guy back on the show, Roy Countryman, which, by the way, I wanted to have him on because he's doing such great work for Fans First Sports Network with his Black and Gold Blueprint podcast. If you haven't listened, go check it out. We do throw a couple of his episodes on our feed so you can get a taste of it, but he does more than just the one show a week. He's doing two shows a week. Uh, Roy's getting geared up for the draft. Roy, welcome to the show. How's it going? I'm doing great, Jeff. I appreciate you here having me on. Uh, I appreciate you plugging my show and and getting into it. I, I do have to catch you here, Jeff. I had been I had to cut it down to one show a week because I went back oh. to my day job. But uh, <laughs> you're going to get all your listening uh, needs here for all your there draft you content on front on Friday mornings. You'll be getting the black and gold blueprint. But uh, no, this is this is Christmas time for me. I'm eagerly awaiting Santa Claus coming to town uh, at the end of April. So I can't wait yeah. to uh, see you know who's finally in the black and gold. Absolutely. And I, my first question for you, Roy, we're going to focus solely on the draft, but I do have to ask a lead up question before that. And that is, have the Steelers positioned themselves well heading into the draft? Now we're still weeks away and moves can still be made. We're not, I'm not about to say that they're done. They can still make a signing, whether it's at center, offensive tackle, any, uh, any number of positions. Do you think they've done a good job up to this point of solidifying the roster and preparing themselves for the draft? Yeah, absolutely. I think they have. Uh, you've seen them kind of target those guys um, in their last, I don't know, week and a half worth of signings to strengthen, you know, the lower part of their roster. And that's really where the Steelers make their hay when it comes to this time of year. They like going into the draft with no obvious needs. Um, this year, the only one I could probably say would be center. Um, but I, it's also not out of the realm that, like, as you said, they still address that with maybe – a player here. And I, I don't think it would be out of the realm that we can maybe see him target a guy like Mason Cole back on a vet minimum type deal familiarity and being up front with them and saying, Hey, you, you're most likely going to have to battle it out with a rookie to, uh, to keep the starting job here. Maybe you only have it for a few weeks until this guy's acclimated. But as far as receivers, uh, you know, they did, did well there. They, they, you know, hit depth along linebacker. I mean, it's, it's really been a whole, process here this offseason that they've done well and bringing guys in and addressing the glaring needs let's go back to the mason cole thing for a second i want to ask you a question think about this from a player's perspective would you sign that deal now or would you wait until after the draft because ultimately you have to think about a veteran presence whether you're talking about brian allen mason cole still out there all these players they might be saying you know what i'm not going to sign anywhere prior to the draft i'm going to wait because i want to see how things play out what are the teams What's going to give me the best chance to play, not just play in general, but also have a chance to start maybe even just for one year? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's you make a great point, Jeff. Um, we're at that weird point of the offseason where you're so close to the draft now, you almost are doing yourself a disservice if you do sign before. Right. Um, and, and I could see a guy, you know, you talked about Brian Allen here and the Steelers like him in your rumors uh, article. A yeah. guy like that coming into a new situation yeah, I'm going to sit back and wait until after the draft because why do I want to acclimate myself to a whole new system if I can maybe go back to a team that needs me that I have more close association with? Now, with Mason Cole, I mean, you've already ran the system for the last two years. For him, you know, what other offers out there is there really for you? So if you're an outside free agent switching teams, yeah, I'm waiting until after the draft. But if it's a guy that I've already been on my prior team, they still have maybe that that need that hasn't been addressed. I might be a little bit more keen to going back to a situation I know I'm more firm in. That's a good point. That's a good point. Now let's let's talk about the draft because you know th there's people that live and breathe this event. I, I love it, but I don't live and breathe it. I just have too much other stuff going on. <laughs> so right now is when I'm really starting to learn about a lot of these prospects, players that you've known for four years in college that I'm just <laughs> learning about now. So let's talk about day one positional options. In your opinion. I think we can all weed down to probably three or four positions that you're like, these are the, these are the places they're looking on day one in round one. What are those positions for you? So for me, um, I, I, you've made the point great. It's four. There's four positions we can really look at. And if they take a player outside of those four positions, that's the one where you're going to get the gasping and awing when they turn the card in. Uh, <laughs> first of all, it's, it's, you look for the positions in the first round, um, of the players that are getting the huge contracts in free agency when it comes to the second contracts. You look at tackle. It's really expensive to find a tackle in free agency. You look at cornerback. You look at pass catchers. 
and we already addressed our quarterback needs. So we have tackle, corner, receiver, and then center. We've been one of the few teams that do value centers in the first round with Marquise Pouncey a few years ago here. You know, we're kind of the outlier when it comes to if we find a guy that we think is just so valuable positionally, we'll go outside of what the realm is of every other NFL franchise. You've seen what we did with Najee Harris, whether you agree with taking a running back in the first round or not. If we're sold on the player that he's that good that we can't pass him up, we will take him in the first round. So running back center in previous years. But if I'm looking, um, I'm going to probably tilt my hand more towards the first three, the tackles, the corner and receiver and center. I would maybe target in a slight trade down situation in the first round to, because it's just been historically a position that not many teams value in that first round range in the first 32 picks that, you know, maybe you're not sold on, on the fifth best tackle at, or maybe the fourth best receiver in the draft, but you like the the center the best you drop down three or four spots pick up maybe a third round pick in, a, in addition and just create your value that you can get more darts to throw at the board in the totality of the draft for other positions that you may want to address later on let's talk about centers quickly if they choose to take a center at 20 i think that it's good it's got to be a player that can come in day one and say i'm the guy you know yeah. marquise pouncey was that guy when he came out of florida is there one of those in this draft? I know a lot of people say Jackson Powers Johnson is that guy. Some might say, but it, I feel like that's like the only option because even if you go to the Graham Barton, if you go to the Zach Frazier, they're all considered like the second tier. They're good. They can play, but they're going to need some time to get acclimated. You agree with that sentiment? That's a hard sentiment to agree totally with. So actually yeah. I, I've been going back and forth here with the center class. I think that you have, um, this is actually one of the most deepest classes of center that you see. I think we could have up to five or six starting caliber centers within the first three rounds of the draft. So you got to look at it in totality of, well, am I going to grab a center in the end of the first round? Is he going to be that much better than maybe a Cedric Van Pran Granger in the third round? Or are we not going to have that much drop off and say a Graham Barton in the first round who Recently, I, I've been a, a staunch believer in Jackson Powers Johnson. Uh, I think he was the best center in the draft. But now I went back and revisited the tape this past week. And uh, after the performance that Graham Barton put on in his pro day, um, that athletic testing kind of puts him in that range of maybe he's my first center now. And a lot of guys are saying, well, he's got to transition back to center. He's one of the smartest guys in the draft of, among offensive linemen. You don't go to Duke with just being some guy that's you know off the cuff with your <laughs> intelligence. Um, so he played at left tackle because he was their best athlete amongst the offensive linemen. They didn't have other. They had a guy named Jacob Monk that played center because he was really good at it. Barton was just the best tackle that they could put out there. So it's not that Barton wasn't their option at center. It was just getting their best five out there. So I think Barton would be my number one center. And I would actually feel comfortable taking him at 20 due to the versatility that he possesses. I think he could get us out of a game at tackle. If need be, I think he could be a pro bowl caliber guard. If he wanted to be, he just really reminds me of a total package in an offensive lineman. Like Alan Fanica was when we had him. There was a yeah. game where he got us out playing left tackle um, after an injury to Marvell Smith in his career. So to me, that versatility kind of enhances him to that 20th range. And Jackson Powers Johnson is a guy maybe I would trade down right above Buffalo or or maybe a Tampa Bay to be able to still get him in the first round. But Frazier's the guy that I'm looking at in the second round. I really think that it's Barton, then it's Powers Johnson, then Frazier. And then you have a group of a lot of other guys. Like I said, Van Pran Granger. You had uh, Bordellini from Wisconsin. Um, and even Mason McCormick from South Dakota State. I think he could play center. Uh, it's more of a projection, but he played a lot of guard there. I think he could be a Pro Bowl caliber center uh, in the league. And that would be a second or third round pick that you could get him with. Yeah, I believe that a lot of people don't realize like Darmani Dawson, he was a guard at one point. And yep. so a lot of these players that are position flexible, they can still become Hall of Fame players in their own right. So when you think about Barton and some people think, oh, he's a tackle, he was a guard, it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to make that switch. Let's talk about something you brought up a little bit earlier as it pertains to trades. So you brought up the situation where if the Steelers were to trade back in round one, maybe acquire another third round pick. And then do you see this 
the way this is setting up and the, the, the picks that the Steelers have acquired, you think about the, the late third round pick that they got for Kenny Pickett. You look at the sixth round picks that they have. Do you see this setting up for Omar Khan and company of being a, a draft where they could be wheeling and dealing some trades, moving back, then moving up to get the players that they want? Do you see it setting up that way? Yeah, I think this this draft is made for Omar Khan and the Khan artist title. I think he's <laughs> Uh, I mean, if they if they sit at 20, it all depends on how this board shakes out. There's talk now after the performances of Bo Nix and, and then the Michael Penix show that he put on the pro day. Um, his stock has been steadily increasing. If we get six quarterbacks off the board before the pick of 20, there's going to be a lot of high-end players left at, at that 20th position. Yeah. So if you have six quarterbacks taken off the board, I think we stay put at 20. If we only have four quarterbacks off the board and you have both Bo Nix and Michael Penix still on the board, that's when Omar Khan's going to make his money as GM. That's when he's going to work the board to drop down maybe late first or maybe one of these teams that are in the first half of the second round overpay to go get a quarterback on a fifth-year option and work with a young coach. I could see Las Vegas doing that and not thinking twice about it because they really need a quarterback. They don't have a lot of other pieces. Otherwise, I mean, Aiden O'Connell isn't their guy. Um, Omar Khan, I think has really set himself up for having a myriad of darts to throw. And I think it would be a situation in that case, Jeff, to where they would move down the first, but then be aggressive moving up in both the second and third rounds. Cause this draft as as well as it has been stocked in the first, say three to four rounds, there is a talent drop off after, say, round five, round six, because there's a lot of players that went back to school with that extra eligibility from COVID. So I don't think Omar Khan's going to be stacking up picks late in the draft. I think he's going to use that ammunition to go up and get as many players as he can within the first, say, 100, 120 overall people on their big board to what they can stock to the positions of the well where they need to be you know, refurbished. So you said, because that was my next question, was these day three picks, are they as valuable as they once were? I mean, having three picks in the sixth round, eh, you're saying that picks rounds one through five are where that's your sweet spot. And then six, yep. you know, after that, you, you're you really seeing a precipitous drop off. Yeah, there. it's not that you can't still find your value picks there, but I would be targeting as many picks as I can in that one through five round range. Um, and then six through seven you're going to get some good depth or maybe end of the roster players, but you're not going to get as many projects or maybe guys that you would get in previous years because they chose to go back with the NIL and all this extra right. eligibility, you know, give Xavier Leggett as a, as an example, he's a fifth year player from South Carolina in previous years. He probably would already been in the NFL, but he stayed last year back in South Carolina. And now he's probably in that second, third round discussion. So I would, I think, that's why he kind of has that Trevor tro- treasure trove of picks in the sixth round that he can pull from and say a third round that he can give two of his six rounds to move up in that third to go get a player that he really wants before we get in that range of the drop off. Yeah. That's why the scenario that I've seen where if the Steelers were to trade back in the first or if they stay at 20, take a tackle. And then if they trade up in the second to maybe get a Zach Frazier to get the, the two pieces of the puzzle that you want there. But let's talk about, some of these position players, you already mentioned the centers, but I want to get your take on the offensive tackles. Uh, is this a deep class? Because I've heard mixed reviews in that regard. Yeah, uh, to me, this is one of the best classes I've scouted in a long time. Um, they just I, I think you could get a starting caliber tackle all the way down to third and maybe even the early fourth round. Um, now, it'll probably be more of a project in that fourth round, but you have guys, uh, you know, a guy like Troy Fatanu, would probably go top 10 in most previous years, but he's talking about as a mid first round pick, he has versatility to play the whole way across the line, but he's been a standout at Washington at left tackle. Um, And then his bookend Roger Rosengarten isn't even in the first round discussion. Um, He's a big time athlete. A lot of experience was actually the blind side protector of Michael Penix. And you're talking about a second round pick that could probably come in and start day one at right tackle. Um, there's just a a dearth of guys in that second to third round range that have versatility to both play both sides, um, still have some upside are big time athletes and, you know, could, could really come in and make an impact. So as much as I love Amarius Mims, um, I, I do think he's the number one target for the Steelers amongst offensive tackles in the first round, just because of his ridiculous upside. 
Um, I'm not going to, you know, say the world is ending if we don't get him, if he's already been taken by another team previously, because second, third round, we could get a guy like Delmore Glaze, who I'm a big fan of from Maryland, who's played both sides. He could have a Marcus Gilbert-esque career at right tackle or the big sturdy uh, tackle from Texas, Christian Jones, who's, you know, has some of the best inline power when it comes to his run blocking. And, you know, to me, it's just there's there's not a huge drop off. Like I was saying earlier to you in center, once you get past, say, the first four tackles, is it that much of a difference that we want to spend it in the first round? Are we going to look at it positionally? Do I want to take the fifth, sixth, seventh tackle in the first round compared to my number one center? What is what is the guy that I value most off of my board? Have you convinced yourself that Dan Moore Jr. is going to be the starting left tackle again this year and Broderick Jones will be at right? I think it's going to come into training camp that way. Um, okay. Even if we take a tackle in the first round, I think it's going to happen that way. Um, I don't think he's going to be the starter by week four of the season. Okay, I think it'll be a similar track to what Broderick Jones would be. For any rookie we have, I think it's just, you know, we would be doing our team a disservice with all the veteran um, on the offense now with Wilson and now all the defensive players to be able to wait for that, you know, learning time to catch up and maybe cause to, cause us to lose a victory or two that would hurt us in the long range. What would really be awful, and this ties in with our discussion about the tackles, is if you have, let's say, I agree with you 100%. Dan Moore goes in as the left tackle. Broderick Jones, you're starting right tackle in training camp. And then the rookie that you have is predominantly a right tackle. And then in week four, they say, okay, we're going to switch Broderick over to the left. But he just had all the offseason reps at right. And yeah. so now he's going back to the left. I really hope that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. But I've, de- I've basically just told myself I'm expecting Dan Moore to be the starting yeah. left tackle. Hey, and we could be, it, it could all depend on the type of player it is too. You know, we're talking about a Marius Mims in the first round here. He's only had eight career starts. You take him in the first round, you probably are looking at a situation where Dan Moore is your guy at left and Broderick's at right. Yeah. If you take a guy that's played two, three years at right tackle, like a Christian Jones from Texas, now you're talking about, I don't need to sit down and give him as many reps. He's got live action at right tackle for three plus years as a starter. Now we can come into camp saying, Dan, you got to face off with Christian Jones for right tackle. Broderick's our cornerstone at left. We got to move yeah. forward with our with our you know our future project here. As you're on your last year of your deal, we're probably not going to resign you. We'll just take our lumps as it is. So, but it all depends on the amount of, of starts that they've had at that college level. You know, Mims, I don't think they would be comfortable eight starts coming right in off the bat, being the right tackle in week one. A guy that has two plus, two, three years plus at starting experience in the big 12 sec. Now you're talking a different story. JC Latham esque, maybe Tyler Guyton had more starts at the, at the college level. You, you might see that kind of peak the interest more that way. All right, let's go to two positions that I I've heard the big names, but man, it that, that just seems like it's for me, it's muddy waters right now. And that is wide receiver and cornerback. There's been a lot of interest shown by the Steelers. I guess my questions aren't necessarily the names. It's where do these players fall in terms of the tiers? You have the top tier talent, the wide receiver we're all talking about. Uh, what, what is it? Marvin Harrison Jr., I believe, yep. uh, is the big name from Ohio State. Uh, cornerbacks, I know that the Steelers have liked the kid from Toledo. Can't remember his name off the top Good of name. my head. There you go. What's your take on these two? You can do one by one, but what's your take? So receiver is way deeper than what corner is this year. I think corner has some some guys that are outliers that w- that you want to probably target within the first three rounds. Receiver, I think I could get a quality receiver anywhere from that first to fifth round, as I was telling you earlier. I think I'd be happy with double dipping even here if we have, an, have enough picks as far as Omar Khan plays the, the board here. Um, I think there's two guys that are completely – out of the realm that the Steelers could could take a chance on. I think Harrison Jr. will be long gone by the time they're yeah. on, as well as Malik Neighbors. Uh, both of them guys are day one starters and playmakers. Now, Aroma Dunze, who the Steelers surprisingly had a lot of interest in at the Combine, um, he's a guy that is in that you know 8 to 12 range maybe, unless it's a surprising if the Cardinals really love him at four, they take him. Um, I could see him being a player that, 
if we're sold that he's going to be a dynamic playmaker, that might be the one player in this draft. It's a blue chipper. I could see us moving up to get. Um, I comped him in, in my personal uh, notes to a Larry Fitzgerald. Um, wow. I, I think, you know, that's I don't throw that comparison around, you know, lightly. He is one of the best at the catch point. His savviness for a big guy as an X receiver, uh, whether it's in press or, or down the field, laterally, vertically, he can win in all ways that you want. Um, and the work ethic alone, if you go back and watch the NFL Combine when he was um, doing his three-cone drill, he kept all the evaluators on the field for an extra 15 minutes because he was simply not happy with the results that he kept getting. He had a number in mind that he wanted to hit. He kept working his butt off for it. So that tells me all I need to know. Oh, and by the way, he's a stud blocker, which we know Arthur Smith likes. So that's the one player in this draft I could see us going up to go get. Um, but if we stay put at 20, Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU is an absolute freak. Um, he reminds me a lot physically and play style wise of Martavis Bryant. Um, just the pure speed, lateral ability, being able to go up above people. He led the college football circuit with 17 receiving touchdowns last year. Uh, so that's if we stay put at 20, he's going to be a target that we could have. Um, Adonai Mitchell from uh, Texas is a quality ball player. Oh, and by the way, he's a Georgia transfer. So he's familiar with all the other guys that we've been drafting over the last couple of years. He's probably in that late first round range that you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at the second round, you're probably getting more into the range of, uh, of Roman Wilson, who put on a big time performance at the combine. Uh, but I think he needs a lot, a lot of technical work. Um, he's more of a slot guy. I'm not sh convinced he's going to be able to win from the outside. But then two intriguing fellas is Mal uh, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. He's kind of a Debo Samuel light player, uh, run after the catch guy. He's not afraid of contact. Now, is he going to deal with injuries at the NFL level like Debo has? Probably, because that's not very conducive, that play style for long-term durability. Um, and Xavier Leggett, I mentioned him earlier. He's a fifth-year player, really started developing physical guy at the catch point and has a lot better deep speed than what you would think for a guy at 6'1", 221. Um, I would kind of reminds me of Juju Smith-Schuster, but maybe a little bit better pure speed. Um, so that's a guy in the first two rounds. You're, you're talking of, you know, three, four or five players there to target. Okay. Um, and then if you're looking at a third round, fourth round player, I think Malik Washington, um, I really like him from Virginia. He's another run after the catch kind of guy. Uh, played a lot at the slot. He originally played at Northwestern, then transferred over to Virginia uh, for his last season. Uh, when he was at Memphis, he played outside a lot more. Uh, but the guy that he mimics his game after is Steve Smith, and he has that type of swagger and confidence. And anytime I can find a player that's like that, I'm always keen to him. So Malik Washington, I think, is a guy that would be an absolute steal at third round if we address these other picks earlier. Right. So that'd be well, where I'd be settling on. Great stuff with the receivers. Before we go to corner, I want to ask you a question. You know, you brought up uh, a couple of these players in terms of where they would where they would kind of find their roles within the Steelers' offense with Arthur Smith. How important is the quote unquote fit? We hear that all the time. They're not a good fit or this fit. How how important is that fit or is being able to coach them up still a thing in the National Football League? I think we've seen both sides of this pendulum swinging in terms of players that didn't fit. You look at like a DeMarvin Leal who kind of doesn't really fit what the Steelers are doing. And then you've also seen players that the Steelers have been able to coach them up and to get them to be what they drafted them to be as they have changed. What's your thoughts on that? I think it's kind of a catch 22. I think a lot of it depends on the player. Um, and a lot of it depends on the success that they've had in a certain system prior. Um, so if they come into the league as a, you know, two time, all, all American and a certain situation and maybe a spread attack. And now you're asking them to block for say 60% of their uh, time on the field. I'm not convinced that you're going to have the buy-in. Because all these players, when they're coming out in the draft, aren't looking at just the situations they're going to be playing in for the next, you know, three, four, five years. All these players are looking at their second contract because that's where all these players make their money. So anytime that I can get in a situation and put my best tape out there in those three to four years that I could then expand upon my contract once and needs, that's where I, I, I need to be doing my work. 
So it's kind of a catch-22. If you get the buy-in, though, that also says a lot for a team like the Steelers that asked players to do more than what the you know the regular tasks are that they have. They ask for the buy-in to maybe, you know, we're going to ask you to block more for the, the best of the team. But we have a lot of selfish players out there. Some of these guys don't just have the love of football when they come in. They're doing it as a job and a means to provide for their families. So I think it's kind of a catch-22. It's it's You get to learn a lot about a player, and that's why you really you know kind of catch the players that are going to be successes and the players that are going to be bust within, the, say, the first two years. Because it tells a lot about their buy-in, their work ethic. Because at the college level, you can get by on pure athleticism and five-star ratings. Because you might be playing other teams in your division that only recruit, say, three stars and under. At the NFL, these players are all five-star players. You're not going to run away from a defensive end like you did at, at you know, say, Pac-12 or against yeah. the MAC. These guys are all quality athletes. And that work ethic and determination and heart is what differentiates themselves in between you know, the guys that are successful in long-term careers. Good insight. Let's go to the last position here. Let's talk cornerback because I think the Steelers definitely need a cor some cornerback help yeah. uh, in, a, in a variety of ways, both in the slot and on the outside. What do you think? You said it's not a deep class, but there are some quality players. Yeah, there's there's a few players here that I would maybe target in the mid-rounds, but if you really want one of the difference makers, you're looking at a guy like Terry and Arnold from Alabama or Quinion Mitchell. Those two are the cream of the crops. Uh, probably going to be gone by the top 15, 18 picks. Um, if Quinion's on the board at pick 20, he's going to have to be somebody they they highly consider. Um, quality athlete, uh, shuts down one side of the field when he's at Toledo, a disruption at the catch point, uh, can play man end zone, has you know the takeaway ability. That's a guy I really like at 20, and it's going to be hard to pass him up if he's there. Nate Wiggins, we've all heard about. Um, they were at his pro day at Clemson. Um, Tomlin was there. Calm was there. They brought him in for a pre-draft visit this past week. Big time, you know, athlete as far as pure speed in a line. Good in press coverage. Leaves some to be desired when he's off in zone because um, he has some transitional issues. Uh, we'll say, you know, dire, but it's just something that could, you know, withstand some separation in his assignment there. Uh, but he's a very aggressive at the tackling point, and he's, he brings his pads. So, he has all those things you want for. He would be a huge addition for a second cornerback. Um, but you're probably going to have to get him in the first round at 20 or maybe drop down just a little bit there. Um, as far as a guy that outside the first round that I am absolutely smitten with um, is Mike Sainer still from Michigan. I think he's Mike Hilton with more explosive athleticism. Um, he brings some nasty and some swagger. He's a former wide receiver. Uh, so he has some playmaking ability at, when the ball's in the air. Um, He's really good at blitzing. Um, he comes from a winning program. I think that is a, a, a pedigree type player that Mike Tomlin, I think, would love to play play around with on his defense at that nickel corner. And it would be intriguing to uh, to see his impact on a, on our Steelers defense. That would be a guy I'd be really targeting in the second round or maybe that first third round pick. Uh, if he's still on the board, it'd be hard for me to pass up. Now, if you're talking a guy, you know, in that third, fourth round range, maybe the day three. Um, a guy like MJ Devonshire from Pitt, I wouldn't be opposed to taking a, a chance on. He ran a four, three, I believe eight as pro day has a lot of experience being left on an Island. Um, he's a high quality player, um, at Pitt, he had a lot of reps as the one, I think he could transition to be a high quality number two, you know, letting JPJ be the alpha. Um, uh, but he'd be a guy I wouldn't be a, a opposed to taking a look at here. Um, and then a local kid, um, uh, Daquan Hardy from Penn State, who has some punt return juice. Uh, he returned two punt returns for a touchdown. Uh, they brought him in for a visit. He'd be a nice guy late on day three, probably in that sixth round range, uh, maybe even later uh, for a nickel. He's very aggressive. He has good transitional skills and be able to carry guys uh, from the slot. So you see all this value and versatility. If I'm going to take it, wait to take corner until day three, I need you to be able to do something, not just – as an outside player, I need you to both play outside and inside and contribute somewhere on special teams. So just a few players to kind of play around with there and and be aware of as the Steelers are on the clock because we definitely need some reinforcements on the in the cornerback room. As we sit here two-plus weeks out of the draft, if you had to give a prediction as to what position they go, 
Which way are you? Which way are you leaning for round one? Well, two weeks out. I'm going to say right now, if I'm on the clock, I think we we come away with a tackle in the first okay. round. That's just my feeling right now. I think we're going to come off the board with a tackle. All right. Good stuff as always, Roy. I appreciate the insight and the thoughts. I'm sure we'll have you back on after the draft to talk all things, the repercussions of what went down with Omar Khan and company. Why don't you plug your social medias and your black and gold blueprint podcast and all that good stuff? Sure, Jeff. And thanks again for having me on. I always uh, appreciate talking ball with you. Hit me up on Twitter at Preacher Boy Roy. Always down to talk shop, talk ball, or anything in life. Uh, go check out in Spotify and Apple of the Black and Gold Blueprint. It's every Friday morning. It'll be dropping. Um, and make sure to go check out 247sports.com. Um, writing for Jim Wexler right now. I'm in the throes of all the draft series going on. So just release the quarterback and running backs um, and the wide receiver tight ends will either be in the coming days here, but then we'll have all the positional groups uh, probably within the next week, week and a half. So go get yourself right. uh, availed to all the names. All right, Roy, as always, thank you very much. We'll talk soon. Take it easy. Thank you, buddy. Stay humble and be a blessing. There you go.